Um, hello, welcome to anyone who is joining us now. Um, you're in the Meet the Chemist session at the minute. Um, my name's Joe. I'll uh, do a quick introduction in a second. Um, we're joined today by Lina Cox, who I'll also introduce in just a second. So I'm Joe. Um, I am a chemist. I'm studying chemistry at Oxford at the minute. I'm in my fourth year. Um, thanks for joining our session today. Um, so this is kind of your chance to put some questions to a recent Oxford graduate who's gone from all the way through A levels through a, a degree in chemistry and now is out working in the world. Um, so this is your chance to to ask her some questions about what she's up to and about, um, about chemistry generally, her experience of chemistry and of work. Um, so Lina is with us, Lina Cox. She is a trainee patent attorney. I know what about one of those words means, so hopefully some of you guys' questions will help us get to the model of what that means. Um, Lina graduated from Oxford in 2020 and started working for a company called J.A. Kemp as a trainee patents attorney. Um, and I'm going to hand over to her now um, to give a quick presentation on uh, what she does. So hi, Lina, uh, go ahead. Hi, Joe. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Joe, for the introduction. Um, I am very excited to be here today. Um, as Joe said, I'm Lina. Um, I'm a bit of an unusual Ask a Chemist this month uh, because I am never in a lab. I'm never touching any chemicals. I haven't done any of my own research for a couple of years, but I'm still using chemistry every single day in my job um, as a trainee chemistry patent attorney. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about what that actually involves. Um, but first, uh, I'm just going to take you through uh, where I've come from to where I am now. Um, so back in 2014, I was doing my GCSEs, that's me, second from left, um, at Caveman College Whitby, which is a little state school um, in very rural North Yorkshire, um, quite a small school. Everyone you're in your year group, you've kind of known since you were 11, if not for a bit longer, um, and quite a rural community. Oxford is a very long way away, not really somewhere that you would go. Um, so I was a bit suspicious of Oxford University, but my grades were all right um, and I loved chemistry. So I thought I would try uh, the unique summer school to see if I liked it. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, the unique summer school is an access programme for state school students where you basically get to go to Oxford and pretend to be a student for a week during summer. So I attended the unique chemistry summer school. Um, I absolutely loved it. I knew that I loved chemistry. Um, what really sold it for me was when I arrived there, everyone was a little bit nerdy, but basically normal um, and really friendly. Um, so it was, it was really, really nice to be with people who were very similar to me. And I thought, well, yeah, if this is what going to Oxford is like, then I'm going to have a great time. Um, so I may as well apply, which I did in 2016. Um, and I got a place at Exeter College to study chemistry, uh, which was great. Um, so the first three years of a chemistry degree um, at Oxford, you're studying all types of chemistry. So organic chemistry, which is kind of on the border of chemistry, biology, through to physical chemistry, which is a little bit physics-y. Um, and at the end of my third year, I decided that out of all of that, uh, my favourite part of chemistry was uh, organic chemistry, medicinal, pharmaceutical chemistry, working on new drugs and that kind of thing. So for my fourth year project, there's me doing some chemistry, um, I joined Professor Tom Brown's group studying oligonucleotide therapeutics. Um, oligonucleotides um, are the little bits which make up DNA. So oligonucleotide therapeutics are drugs basically made of pretend DNA. Um, and um, these drugs, because so many diseases have uh, genetic sources or contributing factors. These drugs um, target DNA at the source so that the proteins which they code for, so DNA codes for mRNA, codes for polypeptides, codes for proteins, um, but if you deal with the DNA, the dodgy DNA at the source, then you're cutting out the causes of diseases before the dodgy proteins which are causing problems are even produced. Um, and 
the problem with DNA therapeutics um, is that, as you'll see here, this is a short bit of DNA. Uh, this has a negative charge here. Cells have negative charges on the outside which repel each other. So it's super hard to get a DNA therapeutic into a cell. Um, and the way Tom Brown's group, one of the ways they approach this problem um, is by replacing this phosphate backbone here with a pretend backbone, um, which in some cases has no charge at all. Um, and these aren't actually the backbones I worked on, but um, I was lucky enough to help write up this research. Um, and we had a paper published just a couple of months ago about a modification that helps therapeutics get into cells. This is kind of tangential um, to what I do day to day, got nothing to do with patent law. But the point I'm trying to make here is that patent attorneys are chemists. We have strong scientific backgrounds. Um, we absolutely love science. Just because we're in a legal setting doesn't mean we have forgotten that and we use it every single day. Uh, that being said, as much as I love science, um, being in the lab was not my forte, a um, little bit clumsy. Um, so a couple of months into my fourth year project, I was fairly convinced that I didn't want a career in lab based chemistry. So I went to the career service and I said, look, I love chemistry, absolutely love it cannot stand being in a lab, what is out there for me? Um, and they pointed me in the direction of patent law. So in 2020, I graduated. This picture is actually from about two months ago because COVID. Um, and I got a job with J.A. Kemp LLP, who are a firm of patent and trademark attorneys. So I train in the, Lon in the Oxford office. We also have a Cambridge office and a London office. This is the view from the rooftop terrace of our London office, which is something we are very proud of. Um, so that's what I do. Um, but what actually does that involve day to day? Um, so a patent attorney is basically responsible for protecting people's inventions. So in the simplest terms, it's a four step process. The first step of which is when inventors come to you um, with their invention that they think they might want to protect. Um, and I would say this is absolutely got to be my favourite part of what I do. Um, so you meet with these inventors who are so enthusiastic, so passionate and have these incredible, clever ideas of these new drugs that they've been working on. Um, what they're showing to you sometimes is the culmination of years of work, decades of work. Um, and they're coming to you and you say, I think that's great let me help you protect it and it feels a real privilege to be able to help them protect things which are so precious to them and which are so so clever um, so once you've decided that there's an invention there um, the next stage is to draft the application and this is where you really have to be a scientist because you've got to understand the invention without having done the 20 years of research yourself inside and out so you've got to be able to describe exactly how it works um, exactly what it is and exactly what you're trying to stop other scientists from copying, um, which is really important. And once you've drafted um, an application which has all of this information in, you send it to the European Patent Office or the UK Patent Office um, and fingers crossed they grant you a patent in 99 0.9% of cases, it isn't as linear as this. And another big part of my job is patent prosecution, which is basically where we argue with the European Patent Office. So they come to us and they go, nah, that's not an invention there. And we have to talk to the inventors and translate their really detailed scientific reasoning to something that the European patent examiners, who are generally legal professionals, can understand. So they come to us, they say it's not an invention. We say, well, actually, because we have a chlorine there or a bromine there, this compound is so much better than anything you've ever seen before. And we argue back and forth with them until eventually, fingers crossed, they give us a patent. Um, the other bit of what I do um, is working with foreign attorneys. 
So patents are a national right. Um, so if you've got a patent application in Japan or America or China, um, you don't have any protection for your invention uh, in the UK or Europe. So we don't draft all the applications which we prosecute. A lot of them come to us from attorney firms all across the world and we help them protect the inventions in Europe. Um, and this is where the legal part of the job really comes into its own because there are subtle differences between the way patents and inventions are treated all across the world. So you get great instructions from people who are experts in Japanese patent law, Chinese patent law, US patent law, um, and you have to translate what they've given to you into something that's suitable for European prosecution, which the European examiners are going to love. Um, so that's a really interesting part of the job, which is a bit more legal and a bit less sciencey. Um, one really key thing about patent law is the use of language. It's proper weird. You've got to make it so that what you're describing, it's completely clear. There's no room for anyone interpreting it in the wrong way. And this can actually lead to patents being quite hard to read if you're not used to the language. Um, so here is an example of a United States patent. Uh, for an apparatus for use as a toy by an animal. For example, a dog to either fetch, carry or chew, including a main section with at least one protrusion extending therefrom that resembles a branch in appearance. That's a stick, um, basically. <laughs> that is a patent for a stick. Um, but because, I mean, if you think about it, how, how would you describe a stick in words which everyone speaking any language, I mean, obviously it's translated for different countries, but you know, with different colloquialisms would understand. And it's really hard to do that. Um, and it comes up with strange texts like this, but actually that's something I really like about the job because um, I did uh, A-level English Lit. Um, and then when it got to university, I was like, oh, that's it. I'm never writing again. I'm a scientist now. Um, but I still get to play with language and science at the same time as a trainee patents attorney, which is a real bonus for me. Um, obviously, I'm not usually working on applications for sticks. Um, I'm working on applications for chemicals. Um, so here's an example um, of a bit more of the language which I'm used to using. This was an invention we had for some molecules. Um, which the European Patent Office said weren't new, they'd been disclosed before. So me and the partner I work with had to look into this document that they'd cited, do really detailed chemical analysis of all the compounds in that and compare them to the compounds which our inventors had made. Um, and we found that a very slight difference in the substitution pattern on one of the rings of one of the uh, chemicals made all the difference. Um, so as you'll see here, I'm arguing that the diortho substitution of the ring makes our invention a proper invention and nothing like this document which the European Patent Office has cited. Um, I do work with all sorts of chemistry. Uh, so I've uh, prosecuted applications for concrete, for rubber, um, still my favourite kind of chemistry is medicinal and pharmaceutical chemistry. Um, on my first day into the office, uh, this is a claim from the first application I ever worked on. It's been granted now, otherwise I couldn't show you because it would be secret. Um, but this uh, was an application. Um, actually, the applicant was a professor who used to lecture me at the university, which was really cool. Um, but it's an application for a compound um, for use in a method of inhibiting bacterial metallobetalactamase. Um, basically, uh, they're compounds which can be used to help fight antibiotic resistance. Um, and on my first day to come into the office and immediately be working on a case which is trying to fight one of the biggest problems that medicine is facing in the next couple of years, that was just so exciting for me. Um, and I think that is what I love the most about my job is that without having to do any research, I am still helping with life-saving research every single day and that buzz hasn't really gone. Um, so that is what life is like for me as a trainee chemistry patent attorney. Um, I hope you have some questions and I look forward to hearing them.
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lina. Um, so um, just to explain how Netflix is going to work, um, I don't think you can see me at the minute, but hopefully my disembodied voice is floating across towards you. Um, I'm going to be putting your questions to Lina, who's going to be answering them. So our first question in from Keshav. Thank you very much for, for sending your question in. The question is, what happens if the same pattern is issued to different companies in different countries? Um, so that's a very technical question. Um, if it's issued to different countries, um, to different companies in different countries, hypothetically, they can both um, they both can do that thing in the country, um, and the other company couldn't do it in their country. In reality, that never happens um, because you can't get a patent on anything that's been previously disclosed. So unless both patents were filed on exactly the same day, if one of them um, was one day before the other, even if it wasn't in the same country, that would stop the second company from getting a patent there, if that makes sense. So although you only have protection um, in the countries which you have a patent in, you can stop other people from patenting it. So you can't stop them from doing it. Um, so if I had a, okay, sorry. If I had a patent in the UK, I could stop people from doing what, I, what my patent was for in the UK. Um, I couldn't stop them doing it in France or Germany, but they wouldn't be able to get a patent for it in France or Germany because a patent already existed, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely that. that yeah, sense. yeah, okay. <laughs> cool, and um, so yeah, do continue to send your questions in guys using the Q&A little tab. Um, so our next question is, um, Lina, did you have to study any law for this job aside from the training you received? Um, no. Basically, I knew absolutely nothing about law when I started. Um, there's a lot of training we receive on the job, including um, a short university course. Um, so after I'd been in the job for a year, I took four months out to get a qualification in patent law, which is really nice because I got to be a student again and go for midweek brunches with my friends, even though I had a job, which was cool. Um, but before I started, absolutely no knowledge of law whatsoever. Nice. And just following on from that, in, in the job itself, what is the kind of split between science and law? Would you say you do more kind of law stuff, more science stuff, or is it, does that question sort of not make sense? Is it all sort of blended? I mean, it is all sort of blended. Um, the thing is, you, you come into the job, everyone comes into the job with a degree in science. So from day one, you're using the science and gradually you're learning the law that kind of goes with it. Mm. So always using the science, but building up the law on the side. And that does mean in the first couple of years, you spend a, a bit more time learning the law so that you can do all aspects of the job. Um, but generally now pieces of work I'm doing all use science and all use law, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And how did the sort of your studies in law when you'd started working, how did that sort of compare to your previous studies either during uni or at A level? Was it very similar? How did that compare? Um, so a lot of the training we do um, is just through work. Um, so the way uh, my, uh, Jay Kemp does it um, is you're assigned a partner, a qualified attorney to work with when you begin. So you do work for them and they come back to you and say, yeah, the science is good, but let's discuss this bit of law. And that's how you learn it. Um, I found it really interesting, actually, on the, the university course, we got to study um, patent law, but also trademark law, copyright law and a bit of English law, how the court system works. And it was I found it really interesting because it's just something completely different to how I'd come across before. Um, but I, it was a pretty typical university course, a bit of essays, a bit of coursework, a bit of exams. Um, yeah. Nice. Um, next question, in what ways is it kind of similar to your chemistry degree, the work you do, and in what ways is it different? And sort of what have you found the most different? What was the biggest sort of 
change difference going towards either generally towards working or towards specifically the work that you do? Um, so, I mean, the biggest difference in terms of the chemistry I'm using um, is that I do spend a little bit of time on Wikipedia um, <laughs> because you learn chemistry very broadly at university. You have to understand the underlying science behind huge concepts and then apply them. Whereas a lot of the scientific work I'm doing is with people who've been researching something really quite niche for a couple of years. Um, so you kind of have to apply the concepts which you've learned at university um, quite nichely and often you need to you know look stuff up, look stuff up to get a bit more context. Um, so more niche science, mm. I would say, um, and the big difference, um, I would say, well, not really with Oxford actually, but um, the way patent law works is is there's a lot of deadlines. Um, so Oxford also has, when you're studying, you have deadlines, you've got to get um, tutorial sh sheets in and worksheets in and stuff like that. Um, but the, the big difference with work is um, you have tasks and more tasks that have to be done by a certain time, um, which can take some adapting to, but actually it's really nice to have a tick list and tick all these things off one by one and really easy to see that you're making progress, which when you're just revising, it's hard to know how well you're doing and whether you've covered everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, so Next question is, um, what extracurricular activities did you do, I guess, either at school or at uni, either sort of generally or that you think were helpful in your, your applying for your current job? Um, I mean, I've done plenty of irrelevant things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I played a lot of sport university. I would highly recommend Corf Gold. No one's ever heard of it and therefore it is ludicrously easy to get on the university team um, because everyone is a complete beginner. Um, I also um, started a football team at my college, uh, which was really nice, played a bit of music. Um, in terms of patent law, um, the most relevant extracurricular stuff I did was in science communication. Um, so, like I said, a lot of what I do is um, translating from very, very technically involved people to people who don't have that level of understanding. Um, and during my university career, I um, wrote various articles for the student newspapers about science, um, which when I went to be interviewed about patent law, um, they were really interested in because they thought, well, that's super relevant, being able to communicate science properly. They were also weirdly interested in uh, the football. Um, we had a long chat about football in my interview, um, but science communication, I would say, is more relevant. Excellent. And was there anything sort of looking more towards sick form and, and school that sort of thinking more about applying to Oxford in the first place? Was there anything sort of extracurricular that you did that you think helped in your your application for Oxford um, or for, for chemistry at uni generally? Um, I just, I, I read a lot um, of science things. I, I think it is, it is really great if you can go out there and you can volunteer and you can do all sorts of exciting things. But I think the university admissions tutors are very aware that not everyone has the same extracurricular opportunities as, as everyone else. Um, so I think what they were most interested in when I applied was definitely just that I was really, really into chemistry. Um, so my personal statement was all like, oh, I read this book and I thought it was great and it made me think this. And then I read this other book and then so um, just just read around chemistry, read outside um, what you're taught on your course. If you find something interesting, look it up. Um, I would say that was the most useful ex extracurricular stuff I did for applying to university. Nice, thank you. Um, next question in is, does an atom's difference make a pattern? So, i.e. If, if something has just one more kind of element than a previous pattern, does that certify a pattern? So is it enough for sort of one atom's difference? Is, is that enough to give you a, a sort of pattern? Um, it depends a lot on context. Um, so patents have to be novel. 
um, which is where the molecule hasn't been disclosed before, but they have to also be inventive. Um, and the way um, inventive step, as it's called, is judged um, is to look at whether a technical advantage um, results from the difference. So if you have something which has a six carbon chain and you have something with a seven carbon chain and they're completely the same and they have the same like efficacy as a drug, for example, you're not going to get a patent for it. If you find that by adding this seventh carbon in the chain, then all of a sudden your drug is a hundred times more efficient, um, then there's potentially a patent there, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. And can you, I mean, this is my own question, can you patent like a process? So for example, if you found that a, a molecule that had already been patented can actually be used to do something completely different than the original patenters thought it could, can you patent the process or is it only sort of molecules that you can patent? No, you can patent uses. So for example, there's a really famous case um, called the Mosabil oil case, and I can't remember what the second use is, but there, there was an existing patent for using this compound, I think, as a lubricant in engines. Um, and then, I mean, this isn't the use that actually was in the case, but if you found that drug which existed, that, that molecule which existed was super good um, as like a treatment for Alzheimer's disease or something, you could have a, a patent um, for use of that drug at use of that compound in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease and that would be new and inventive because you've got a new use there which nobody would have imagined would possibly be a use from the existing art. Yeah nice excellent and um, looking back to your days as an A-level student um, do you have any top tips for our A-level students listening in today? Oh um I mean, revise in your own way. I We had a lot of, um, for, for me it was past papers and I just slaved away for hours and hours and hours doing past papers um, and that was what worked for me. For my friends it was making mind maps or making revision cards and going over and over these again. I wouldn't look at what other people are doing and think that's what you have to do. Um, if you find it doesn't work for you, that's just going to be a waste of your time. So figure out the best way that you revise um, and do that, I think is really key. Um, I think also have a life, um, especially at university um, and at A-level as well. It is absolutely no good for your mental health and for your physical health and does not serve you well in exams at all to wake up and revise and maybe have a pot noodle for lunch and then revise and then finish revising and then immediately go to bed. You're not going to be in a good mental state to sit your exams. It's really important to take a walk, to take a breather, just to make sure you're still yourself. Otherwise, you're you know that that's a recipe for burning out if you're if you're not careful. Definitely yeah it's a marathon not a sprint is what I was always always told when I was doing my A-levels. Um, nice so our next question is what were the books that you have read that you have found interesting and helpful to really get into chemistry? Any book recommendations? Oh, oh I need a copy of my personal statement in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mendeleev's The Periodic Table is a classic one, absolute classic. Um, Oxford University does, I can't remember what they're called, but they do like a series of little pocket guides. Joe, you might know what I'm talking about. Oh, uh, yeah. The, uh, oh, primers. They're called Oxford Primers. Oh, the primers, yeah. The Oxford the primers. primers. Um, and they have this huge series of books, which are all like tiny, tiny little books. Um, but they go into really specific areas of chemistry, all the sciences, um, and they're at quite an accessible level at the beginning. And then by the time you've got to the end, you're quite knowledgeable. Um, but I would recommend the Oxford Chemistry Primers. Um, also, you know, have a go at reading articles um, from, uh, you know, Nature, Nature Chem, um, Organic Chem, all the, the chemistry journals. Um, if there's something you're interested in, 
they might be quite hard to get your head around, but even just reading the abstracts, like the little introductory bits, can be really helpful to give you a background on um, quite upcoming science. So that's where you kind of need to go for your, your up to date, your scientific breakthroughs and stuff. Excellent. My big recommendation is why chemical reactions happen by Keeler and Waddles. It's the book that, yeah, yeah. That made, literally made me apply to Oxford and put it all over my personal statement. It's a good book. It's like pitched just between sort of A level and uni. So if you're thinking about doing doing chemistry at uni, it's a good sort of preview of it, and it looks good on a personal statement. Um, right. Next question is: Can you talk to us a little bit more about your research in synthetic oligonucleotide backbone mimics? For example, how do you insert the phosphate mimics, and once it's inside the cell, how does it make an impact? Oh my goodness, I can. <laughs> it's been a while, um, but oh, it, it's great. It's incredible oligonucleotide chemistry. Um, so do you mean how do you insert the... I mean, I'll, I'll just answer it both ways. I, I'm kind of assuming you mean how, how do you add the mimics into DNA um, in the first place? And the way that you do that is to um, create just... Um, little individual uh, nucleotides so you can quite easily buy um, adenine, thymine, guanine, uracil, the, the, the building blocks of DNA as little individual molecules um, and then we would work with those um, to add groups just to the individual um, building block uh, which weren't the phosphate. So actually I was working with positively charged backbone mimics, um, which um, are like as far from phosphate as you can really get. Um, and they, um, so we would build uh, little molecules just with one of these mimics in. Um, and then you put, there are machines which can build little strings of DNA for you. Um, they're, they're so clever, so clever. Um, but you would just put one of these non-standard uh, building blocks you'd made in a machine with the other standard building blocks, which you can just buy. Um, and this machine sequences it for you. Um, and then, hang on. Um, so there are several ways which once you get it into a cell, oligonucleotide therapeutics can work. Um, so antigene um, is when, I was pointing at my screen then, you can't see my finger, that's weird, um, <laughs> but um, is when you interrupt at replication and transcription. Um, so you bind in a duplex, you interrupt the duplex of DNA before it becomes mRNA, and mRNA is the stuff that's actually read to become um, polypeptide than a protein. Um, antigene are a bit harder to do, antisense um, are much better. Um, and what they do is they bind um, with mRNA uh, to create a duplex that looks a bit like this. Um, but when they bind with the mRNA, uh, they get um, recognized as a duplex by um, there's enzymes in the nucleus um, which uh, cut up duplexes um, and so once you've got your antisense strand bonded to an mRNA it gets cut up by these enzymes and then just doesn't get to the point where it's being translated to be a polypeptide um, if that makes um, I'm not is that, is that okay? I'm, I'm not sure yeah. um, where you guys are at in terms of eight level GCSE uni stuff. So I hope that made sense. But Excellent. I haven't done organic chemistry for about half a year now and I just about managed to follow. So I think good stuff. A, good stuff. Good explanation. <laughs> right. Let me find my next question. Um, so who generally applies for a patent. So you mentioned you sort of bumped into a, an old professor of yours during during the start of your work. Yeah, so other than sort of professors who are doing research, who is it that applies for a patent generally? Oh, we get all sorts. 
Um, so uh, in the chemical team, we're working with some big pharma companies as well. Um, so like GSK, um, Eli Lilly, um, various really quite global um, companies. A lot of them actually have their own in-house attorneys because they're big enough that they don't have to rely on a private firm, um, but we do some work for them. Um, a lot of work for universities um, and also spin outs from universities. So quite often when a professor working at a university has an especially good idea, um, they will get an investor to license it and create a little sub company um, that spin out, spins out from the university. Um, and I'd say the majority of the work we do is for those kind of companies who have originated in universities and are now small businesses um, or in some cases pretty large businesses um, in their own right. Um, but I mean I've, I've even done patent applications for individuals who've just come to us and gone I think I have an idea who, who have no affiliation whatsoever. That's a bit more difficult because um, patents are quite expensive to file. Um, so for a GB patent, um, you're talking a couple of hundred pounds in official fees. Um, for a European patent, you're talking a couple of thousand pounds in initial fees to begin with. Um, but then by the time it gets granted, you've probably paid up to about a hundred grand um, to get it validated across all of Europe and to cover attorney fees and official fees and stuff. Excellent, thank you. It's interesting. Um, Next question is, um, would you be able to get work experience from your patent attorney? Say, I guess your company, does it do um, work experience? And, and if so, what sort of ages is that sort of aimed at? We don't do work experience, unfortunately. Other firms do. Um, and I would definitely recommend looking into that. Some of them have like formal internships for university students who are looking to go into a career. Um, others may offer work experience for people who are sitting A-levels um, or GCSEs and just after something uh, to, to get a taste. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a bit of a weird one, I'd say. Patent law is, there aren't all that many firms that offer work experience and it's one of those ones where it's actually can be more difficult to get work experience than it can be to get a job, um, which seems very confusing to me. But um, that that is that is the way it is at the minute, unfortunately. And and if there was a say an A level student or a student still at school who is sat there thinking, oh, that sounds pretty good. I'd quite like to become a patent attorney. What would your sort of advice to them be? What can they kind of do at this stage um, to sort of, I guess, pursue that to, to start looking towards that kind of career? Um, so science degree, any kind of science. Um, we even take math students, I think, um, even math. Um, <laughs> um, and um, look into science communication. Um, so writing for articles, send them to student newspapers, just local newspapers, online, um, you know, websites which publish scientific articles. Um, and, you know, if you're at an A-level stage, that is plenty of time to read up on patent law as well. Um, there's some really interesting developments at the minute. There's um, a unitary patent coming in. Um, which uh, will be a patent for all EU countries, which um, is something where we're all running around trying to figure out how that's going to impact our work at the minute. Um, and I think the CIPA website, C-I-P-A, um, that has all sorts of news stories on updates um, to patent law. Um, uh, there's also um, a website called um, the uh, IP inclusive, um, which has loads of resources um, like teacher packs um, and similar stuff um, to be read by students as well on IP. Um, reach out uh, if you've got LinkedIn, might be a bit young for LinkedIn, um, but reach out to training pattern attorneys, see if they're willing to chat with you about what they do on the day to day. You can ask them lots of questions. I'm on LinkedIn, you can find me. Um, and yeah, try and learn that but but most of important of all is is try and get a science degree 
that is the key. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Um, our next question is, um, do you guys work as a team or is it more sort of work on your own type of work? So as a trainee, um, because you have to be a qualified attorney to um, like formally submit responses and arguments at the European Patent Office, um, all my work has to go through a partner. Sometimes I write it, they just put their name on it. Um, but most of the time it's a really collaborative process. So um, we get instructions from a client or we get um, an examination report we need to respond to. I have a stab at writing it and then I'll send it to the partner or the attorney higher up that I'm working with and we'll sit and discuss together, you know, whether the arguments are strong or weak, whether we should try and make this point or whether we should make this change to the patent in order to potentially give it a better chance of getting granted. So initially I'm doing work by myself, but then it's discussed at least with one other person to try and get it into the best state before we send it out to people. Um, also there's, um, because I'm in a bigger firm, um, there's uh, five trainees in my year. We roughly have five to eight trainees starting at the same time every year. Um, and we have a WhatsApp that we're on to each other all the time with questions. Have you come across this situation before? What do I do if a client asks this? Um, and also I go there based in London. I go see them quite often and we have tutorials and stuff where we work together and train together. Um, so not not by myself a lot of the time. Nice. Excellent. Thank you. And um, you mentioned um, the sort of the idea of becoming chartered. Could you explain a little bit about what that means, what the sort of chartered status means and what is it like sort of going through what is or was it like sort of going through that process? Oh, very much is. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, um, so patent attorney is a protected term, which means you can't call yourself a patent attorney unless you've got um, chartered status. So you may have noticed I have been, I've been trying to be very careful throughout this to refer to myself as a trainee patent attorney um, because I am not a patent attorney yet. Um, the reason it's it's chartered is because it's a position of like quite legal responsibility. I mean, for the big companies we work for, their patents can be worth, I mean, billions of pounds. Um, so you need to be quite responsible. Um, and um, in order to get this chartered status, you do need to take some exams. So um, the university course that I mentioned earlier is one exam which I've taken. Um, and then next year I have some European qualifying exams um, and the year after I have some more European and some UK qualifying exams. Um, and there we're kind of trained to do them as we're working because they're really practical exams. So um, the European qualifying exams, one of them is basically just here's an invention can you write the patent please? Um, and another one is here's an examination report can you respond to it and explain why your um, your application should be allowed to be a patent? So they're really practical exams. They're really relevant to what you're actually doing day to day. Um, there's a bit, um, there's one exam which is quite legal um, and you do have to do a bit of revision for that. But once you've passed all of those, you can call yourself um, a UK patent attorney and a European patent attorney. Most, you don't have to get dual qualified, um, but most attorneys working in the UK get UK and European qualified status, um, which means we get to go to Munich sometimes and talk in the European patent court, which is quite cool. Excellent, cool, thank you. Um, Next question is, is there lots of extra research involved? So um, I guess let's take that from the angle of when you're applying to become a, for your job as a patent, as a trainee patent attorney, did you have to do some lots of research into what, what a patent attorney was? Um, so I, I went to careers fairs and I talked to people there and they pointed me in the direction of some resources. Um, and there's also a lot of websites um, like careers guidance websites, which, you know, describe life as a trainee patent attorney. Um, I had a little look into the basics of patent law, um, 
but I think genuine generally because everyone is coming from a science background because work experience is relatively hard to come by there isn't really an expectation um, from firms who are recruiting that you have a really deep understanding of patent law when you start if at all um, there's some basic concepts um, which I would read up on but you can quite easily google them I'd say I probably spent a couple of hours in the few days before I had my interviews and before I submitted my applications learning up and making sure that if someone said to me uh, novelty or ooh, inventive step I would be like aha I am not completely clueless um, but it wasn't a huge time commitment oh nice that's good to hear and sort of relates to that relates to what we were talking about before about um, your training and exam stuff how long does that last for sort of how long are you trained for um, so I started in October 2020. I will take my final qualifying exams, fingers crossed, um, in October 2024. So it's it's quite a long process, um, but I am all trainee patent attorneys get paid as professionals the whole way through, um, and you work and you charge out your time from day one. Um, so while you're training, um, it you still feel like a professional um even though it is it is quite a long process yeah about four to five years typically before you're fully fully qualified oh excellent thank you um and so you're telling us a little bit about your your part two research project a bit earlier um in, in the sort of the oligonucleotides sphere have you been able to do much work on that kind of thing thus far and sort of I guess relatedly do you get much choice in what you what you work on um, either now or looking forward to the future when you're um, when you get higher up in the company? Um, so we do have a couple of clients who work very directly in the oligonucleotide sphere um, and when applications to do with oligonucleotides come up quite often I will get an email saying oh we've had this new case isn't this what you do do you want to help out and I'm like yeah sure um, so people everyone has their little niches and everyone is aware of their niches and um, when you join the firm one of the first things you do is uh, give a little presentation on your previous research um, so that everyone knows that you're the one to call on if something to do with oligonucleotides comes up um, in general, we have tried to give quite a, a broad spread of chemistry. So like I said, I've done I've done some applications on concrete, which is absolutely nothing to do with um, anything that I've researched before. Um, but I do mainly do pharmaceuticals because that was what I did in my fourth year. And um, you're assigned to a partner, your mentor um, when you start and they tend to try and pick your mentor based on your background in research and their background in research. So um, my mentor, uh, who's the head of chemistry here, uh, pretty much all the cases she does are pharmaceutical stuff. So a lot of work I do with her um, and a lot of work I do is pharmaceutical. Um, I think, I mean, it hasn't been the case, but I think if I was getting a lot of, and I, it's more the case in other departments so in engineer we have a biology department a chemistry department and an engineering and IT department um, and the engineering and IT department employs physicists mathematicians computer scientists engineers so in that department there's a bit more of people going oh actually this is nothing to do with my degree maybe you're better off sending this work somewhere else uh, with chemistry we can kind of handle anything that's thrown to us but um, I'm sure if I needed to, I could be like, this just doesn't mean anything to me. Maybe send it somewhere to someone else. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, our next question is, um, how long does each patent take? And do you work on more than one patent at a time? Um, so from filing of an application to grant can be is normally three to five years it's it's not a quick process um, and therefore I am working on many many different patents at the same time um, so drafting of an application um, normally takes two to three weeks um, and during those two to three weeks a lot of my time and energy is going into drafting because a patent draft can be 
um, you know, a hundred more pages long. So that's quite a big job. Um, but at the minute, I um, I don't have many drafts I'm working on. So uh, I'm doing a lot more work on a lot more different cases. Examination reports typically take us a couple of hours to uh, respond to or to report. Um, so each week I'm probably working on 20 to 30 different cases, which is really great because it's so not boring and <laughs> new stuff comes in all the time. You, you don't have time to be like, oh, if I have to look at another beta lactamase inhibitor again, I'm going to scream. You just don't have time to do that. It's so varied. Oh, excellent. Um, our next question is um, for your patents, how much research is involved? And does your job involve lots of essay writing in order to explain the reasoning behind your patent? Um, so it really depends on who the client is. Typically, we like clients to do a lot of the research themselves um, and then they come to us. We try really hard to understand their research to turn it from so, you know, um, for a patent draft, we'll get sent like a couple of papers, um, a big long experimental section. They've done all the research themselves and then we filter through that, pick out the key points um, and and turn that into a patent. So we haven't done any of the actual research ourselves, but we've done the the transforming of a load of some relevant, some not so relevant chemical information and distilled it into the relevant invention. Um, we also spend a lot of time um, talking to the inventors when we're first drafting. So because they're such experts, um, often the stuff they give to us <laughs> makes very little sense to begin with. Um, so we have, you know, like whole mornings of meetings where we'll be like, explain this and explain this and ah, but if that's that, why is that? And they have to explain their invention to us. We take lots of notes and that's where uh, and that's when we complete the draft. I can't remember the second part of the question. <laughs> and the second part of the question is, um, does your job involve lots of essay writing to explain your reason behind your patent? Um, so essay writing is perhaps a bit, I wouldn't describe it as essay writing. So, so patent applications, they are big chunky documents. Um, and um, some of the stuff that the first bit is quite essayish generally, that's where you describe the background of the invention um, and what's come before and kind of hint at what your invention is. Then when you go into describing the invention, that's less of an essay structure and you're more using like protocols um, and describing, you, you'll see a lot of patents look quite repetitive because you've got to make sure that everything in there is really well defined. So you'll be like, there are pa uh, paragraphs which will be like an alkyl group, maybe a C1 to 20 carbon. For example, it may be a C1 to 10 carbon. When it's a C1 to 10 carbon, it might be hexyl, it might be heptyle. And that kind of text, we just kind of copy and paste. Um, so um, that bit is not so much essay writing. Responses as well um, are not essays generally, they're letters. Um, so when we're responding to the European Patent Office, um, there's some, you know, formulaic legal things we have to say. And then, you know, the average response is, I'd say, two to three pages long, um, including that legal text and including the address at the top and the sign off. So not essays so much, um, but lots of writing, definitely. Oh, excellent. Nice. Um, our next question is, um, have you learnt more about chemistry through your work? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've learnt a lot more about chemistry that's actually relevant today. Um, it's important in your degree that you go right back to the basics and you build from, you know, the electron models to how these things work to known reactions because knowing all this background is what enables people to come up with new things um, but I'm just dealing with new things so everything that comes to me is is new and exciting chemistry um, 
that hasn't been seen before. So I have a much better sense of of what's actually happening in chemistry at the minute, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Excellent. And um, so with five minutes to go, if there are any more questions, if you're sitting there with a question burning on your mind, deciding whether to submit it, now's the time to do that. Pop all your questions through and we'll do a final few questions. Um, one more from me. Um, I understand you might not be able to to say, but what's the coolest pattern you've seen either in your work or if you can't say that, you know, case law and anything you've you've just come across? I can't really. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really really annoying actually because I stuff happens and then I want to rush home and be like you will not believe, but but I'm just not allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, I mean, what interests me most is um, is new cancer therapeutics. Um, when we've had some some stuff come in, which I think is going to be in the in you know in the next five to ten years could could be really important in terms of cancer treatment and I am excited for when those patents get granted and for when those drugs get approved it's going to be going to be good times. Excellent and um, cool and uh, next question is are there any cases where after drafting your report and making your report you think that actually this invention shouldn't be patented? You, you yourself think that oh actually this shouldn't be patented um so pro probably yeah i mean it, it it's really hard because there are some things what what can be patented and what should be patented don't always match up and actually there's some inventions where it's a really good invention, but it just doesn't fit um, with what with what's allowable under patent law. So, for example, there's a lot of stuff around um, medical methods of treatment in Europe. You're not allowed to patent um, a method of medical treatment because I mean, it's, it's a whole thing to stop doctors being sued for infringing patents. Um, and, and it's really sad because Sometimes, you know, people have come up with these amazing methods of medical treatment, um, which, you know, aren't necessarily patentable. And we have to do our best to try and get them through to try and put them in a format because actually they are really clever ideas. Um, but whether they are actually patentable subject matter is sometimes a bit debatable. But we're always um, we're always on the side of our client. And I, I think pretty much always there is something there um, which could be a patent. Oh, amazing. Thank you very much for that answer and for all of your answers, Lina. Um, so, yeah, everyone here, thank you very much for all your questions. They were really good questions. I think I now understand what a patent attorney is, so that's helped me at the very least. Um, Lina, thank you very much for your time and for your excellent answers to all our questions. Um, it's lovely having you here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you all. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.